Welcome, everybody. Uh, our first speaker is uh, Thomas Schuster. He's a local. And uh, he will talk to us about operator size, error propagation, and the Roshni Teco in many body quantum system. All right. Uh, thank you guys for the introduction. Um, and it's really great to be giving an in-person talk again. Um, yeah, so I'm Thomas, Tommy Schuster. Um, I'm a grad student with Norman Yao at Berkeley. And today I'll be telling you about some recent work uh, that me and Norm did. Um, and this work originated with a fairly simple question of, you know, people are starting to measure this thing called information scrambling in experiments. And the question was just, how does experimental error affect these measurements? And uh, it turned out that the answer was a little bit richer than we thought. And um, it had connections to some other questions in physics concerning the Lashmet echo in many body quantum systems. Um, so uh, let's dive in. So just a brief outline. I'll start with a, an introduction just to scrambling and specifically some recent you know, experiments and ways of doing experiments to measure scrambling. Uh, I'll turn to our main result, which is a fairly simple intuitive framework for the effect of errors on measurements of scrambling. And the key result here um, is a prediction that the way that errors influence scrambling is not determined by the microscopic form of the error. It's determined by the scrambling dynamics themselves. And uh, so with this framework in hand, we'll turn to apply it to a few examples, um, specifically a 1D spin chain and 0D, so all-to-all -all systems called fast scramblers. And we'll see, you know, people know that these systems display very different unitary scrambling behavior. And we'll see that in correspondence to that, in the former, error will nearly unaffect scrambling. It will leave it about the same as before. And in the latter, it will halt scrambling altogether from the experiment's perspective. And if we have time, I'll discuss briefly some connections to the many body Lashmet echo and some intriguing recent NMR experiments. So I want to start um, with uh, a particular way of introducing scrambling, which is through the context of the reversibility of many body dynamics. Uh, so, so I want to, you know, flash back to the 1870s when Boltzmann was formulating his theory of thermodynamics. Um, and intuitively in th thermodynamics, if we start with some highly ordered state, a bunch of particles in one corner of a box, over time, if these particles bounce into each other in the walls of the system, this will evolve to some thermalized, uh, seemingly random state. And so, uh, you know, on the contrary, we never expect the reverse process to happen for a, a seemingly, you know, thermalized state to time evolve into something in the corner of the box. So this is just saying that thermodynamics is a, an irreversible theory. There's an arrow of time. And so Lashmet, Boltzmann co Boltzmann's colleague, was, was bothered by this because the fundamental laws of nature are reversible. And sp so specifically, he posed this thought experiment. If we reverse the momenta of every particle in that box and evolve it forward via Newton's equations again, uh, all of these particles will recluster back into the corner. And so, of course, we know in practice that uh, this doesn't happen. And um, the reason is that thermodynamics is a statistical theory. You know, this in principle could happen, but it's exponentially unlikely to happen. So, Toby, uh, just very quickly, I think you're still muted. So if I'm you can muted. <laughs> That's not great. Um, yes, now probably. Okay. Yes. Apologies to everyone on the Zoom link. Um, <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, uh, and so one particular way to see that this is a. Uh, yeah. Yes. Um, can people on the Zoom link let us know if things are working? It's looking good now. Thank you. Yeah, now we can. Thank you. So sorry about that. Um, okay. Oops. Um, so one particular way to see uh, that this reversibility is highly non-generic is to consider what happens if we. Uh, you know, time evolve forward. And now before we time evolve backward, we give one of these particles a small kick. And then we try to reverse this dynamics. We flip the momenta of every particle. Um, generically, because all of these particles have bounced off of each other uh, within this whole process, this will disrupt this entire uh, procedure of refocusing the particles in the corner. 
and will just stay in some thermalized state. And so, of course, as we all know, uh, recently, um, people have been very interested in this question in the context of quantum many-body experiments. And so here, the analogous process would be we start with some many-body system. We insert some initial state, some initial information into one of the qubits. We time evolve it forward under some unitary U generated by some local dynamics. And of course, we know that in principle, applying the, the reverse unitary will refocus this information back onto the original qubit. Um, and so the analogous procedure to this kick would be evolving forward, applying some small perturbation, so some local, say, poly matrix on some qubit, far away from psi potentially, and then trying to reverse our time evolution and recover our state. And what we see is that in the, in the quantum context, um, the sensitivity of time reversal to perturbations is really determined by the delocalization of information under this unitary. Specifically, um, it's been found that under sort of generic interacting unitaries, the information of psi will become delocalized uh, to be contained in correlations between all the qubits in the system. And of course, you, Dagger, in principle, refocuses those correlations. However, if we take these delocal this delocalized information and we apply this uh, single qubit poly matrix, this will disrupt this refocusing and will not recover any information at all. And so this, this delocalization of information goes under the broader name of quantum information scrambling, um, which broadly corresponds to the increasing complexity of initially simple information under many-body time dynamics. And a slightly more formal way of writing down this delocalization is in terms of operator spreading. So here we think we have some initially single body uh, operator O. And under time dynamics, time evolving that O, it grows to have support on many qubits. And so this tells us that initially local information grows to be contained in highly non-local correlations. And so you know, this concept of information scrambling also has many other features, in particular in the growth of entanglement in many body systems. And uh, hopefully I've convinced you in a small part that it's helped our in that understanding this has helped our understanding of quantum thermalization. Um, it's also helped our understanding of classical simulation algorithms for quantum systems, if we know which information we can throw away and which we can keep. And of course, uh, the focus of this workshop, there's been tremendous connections and insights and open questions between this information scrambling and quantum gravity. But yeah? Uh, is it important to you, I mean, there's, there's two things we could in principle distinguish, right? One is um, that the operators spread over many mm -hmm. uh, physical degrees of freedom, um, and the other is complexity. In other words, they could spread over many degrees of freedom, but it's still not very complex. Yes. Sure. For yeah, so, so um, for our purposes, it's really only the the delocalization, the the number of sites that has support on that's important, not the complexity. Of course, in general, these seem to grow together in most systems, but yeah, for our purposes, it's really the delocalization well, of information. I would have thought that generically, you first delocalize, and then mm -hmm. you have a lot of time to go where you can increase the Yes. In the Yes, so, so they sort of, I think, while things are being delocalized, your complexity is kind of limited by how much you've delocalized, and then there's still much more room to grow at later times once you've fully delocalized. Yeah. Um, but here we're really, we'll be concerned mainly with just this delocalization. Um, okay, and so for all these reasons, we'd really like, um, you know, there, there's been a lot of works studying how scrambling occurs in different systems. There's many different ways in which systems scramble. And one thing we'd really like to do is measure this in experiment. And so there's a couple ways to do it. The most common probably is exactly, um, you know, similar procedures to this time reversal protocol I showed on the first slide. But there are clever ways to do this that get around time reversal. Um, some that use an exponential number of measurements instead of time reversal or which trade time reversal for having multiple copies of your system, which must be entangled with each other during your experiment. And so when this collaboration began, and I was a, an early grad student a few years ago, uh, most of these proposals were only in theory. But by now, uh, all of them have been implemented in experiments. And in particular, there's been a large class of experiments in these reversible time evolution protocols. And one question 
that, that emerges now that scrambling has sort of entered the experimental domain um, is how do experimental error and decoherence affect our measurements of scrambling? So every real world experiment is going to have some error, say from imperfect quantum gates or from interaction with some environment, some bath, and we want to know how those impact scrambling measurements. Um, so this is on the one hand a very practical question. Uh, we like to simulate unitary dynamics. The dynamics we simulate is not unitary. How do we interpret our results? And on the other hand, ties back to these sort of long-standing questions about the Lachmann echo in quantum many-body systems. Uh, so you can imagine now it's not some artificial perturbation P disrupting my time reversal, but rather the intrinsic decoherence that's occurring throughout time evolution. And I could ask, say, what is the fidelity of this reversal as a function of time? And on both sides of this, um, you know, share sort of common open questions. So on the side of scrambling measurements, there are uh, heuristic arguments out there in a lot of these works for how uh, error should affect scrambling measurements. Um, but there's no sort of cohesive framework unifying all of these predictions. For instance, some argue that scrambling measurements are nearly unaffected by error, and some argue that uh, they're strongly affected by error. On the side of the Lachmann echo, there's been really significant groundbreaking work on this in the early 2000s in the context of single particle quantum chaos. Um, and there's also been a long line of experiments in the NMR community on this in the many body regime. Uh, but in the many body regime, uh, the, the status is sort of similar to this left hand side, where there's you know, lots of results and some sort of phenomenological explanations, but no really concrete framework unifying all results. And so, of course, in this talk, um, I hope you know, to provide a framework that a framework for the effect of local errors on information scrambling that explains sort of a, and encompasses a large class of these previous experimental and numerical results. And again, the, the key uh, feature of this framework is that the effect of errors is determined not by the specific errors, but rather by the scrambling dynamics of the system itself. And so uh, to dive into this, um, we need to introduce one particular quantity, which is how we measure scrambling in the context of this talk. Um, and so to define this quantity, which is the operator size, I'm going to start with just a single poly string. So a poly string R, that's a tensor product of some single qubit polys at each site. Now, a familiar quantity to some of you might be the out of time ordered correlator. Roughly, this measures the commutator of R with a local operator, say Z, uh, at the, a given site, say this green site. And so this measures, roughly, whether R has support on that site or not. A more global probe of uh, the support of R is the operator size, which is just the total number of non-identity elements in R, so the total number of sites it has support on. So in this example, R would have size 1, 2, 3, four, five, six. And so this was all for a single polystring. Uh, more general operators will be a superposition of polystrings with some coefficients, CR. And in particular, they might be a superposition of both low size polystrings and high size polystrings. And so in general, operators have a size distribution defined by these coefficients, CR. Uh, so I've drawn this distribution here, say the probability to have size S versus S. And we can characterize this distribution by, say, its average size, s bar, and its width, delta s. And you know, so there's, this is a, a lot of work has gone into sort of characterizing these distributions in a number of systems. So now I, I want to present just this simple intuition for connecting operator size and errors. So now imagine I have this time-evolved operator on some many-body system. And I have just some local decoherence at every qubit in the system. So we know for a specific polystring of M, it can't be affected by local errors that are outside the support of that string. You know, it just, it doesn't, if it doesn't have support on this qubit, it will be unaffected by those errors. And so if we look at these strings, you know, we have small strings and large strings, we see that each string is affected by a number of local errors proportional to the number of qubits it has support on which is exactly the operator size. And so we have this very simple intuitive connection between the size of polystrings and amount, the amount that they decay due to local errors. 
And so if we were to draw this on, uh, on the si this plot of the size distribution, we might imagine we have some unitary size distribution shown in blue. And if we evolve this under some local errors, we expect the errors to damp the high size components of the strings by some significant amount, say, and the low size components of the strings very little. Sepper? Yeah, yeah, just decoherence. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, this, this connection has sort of been noted qualitatively in a number of previous works. Uh, and what we want to do is sort of make this a little more formal and kind of run with it in a bunch of models that, that people have established for operator spreading. And uh, just one note, uh, how to think about this physically. If we imagine these errors come from the system coupling to some bath, what this is telling us is that large size poly strings couple more strongly to the bath and they grow to have support on the bath more quickly. And once that happens, those strings are effectively um, irreversible from the context of an experimentalist who only has access to the system. So you know, the, these poly strings are, are lost because they have support on the bath. And so the effective size distribution accessed by the experimentalist only contains the smaller size strings that are left behind. Okay, so uh, I'll go through this quickly, but we can make this a little bit more formal. If we consider the Heisenberg equation of motion for some operator M under Lindbladian dynamics, so local errors that are uncorrelated in space and time, we have uh, some unitary piece and we have some uh, errorful piece uh, controlled by these local Lindblad operators L. And our assumption uh, is that the high size components of M are you know, in some ways very chaotic. You know, they, they have support on exponentially many poly strings if they're very large, and they vary rapidly in time because they, they commute with the Hamiltonian at every site. And so we assume that these behaviors cause uh, the evolution of these strings under error to be relatively insensitive to the specific Lindblad operators L. And under this assumption, we might as well replace these Lindblad operators with any local operators. So in particular, uh, I'll choose local poly operators at each qubit. And in this case, you can show precisely that this uh, Lindblad equation for these specific errors is precisely equal to uh, unitary dynamics minus the error times the size super operator acting on M. So this just multiplies each poly string of M by its size. And so, uh, you know, in principle, you know, this, this is a nice way to sort of think about how size affects your dynamics. Um, for a generic Hamiltonian, it's not immediately solvable. And so in what follows, we'll sort of describe first broadly how error, we expect error to affect the dynamics, and then analyze this in a, a couple of concrete models. So uh, we observe sort of two qualitative effects of error on the dynamics. And we can see them from this previous plot I've shown. Yeah? Sorry, so the Limbladian Sarton. They are single body operators? Yeah, I'm a single body or you know, spatially local if you have some uh, like spatial system. Point -wise, like site -wise local. I, if you have, um, say, like a, a 1D system or something, as long as they're nearby, like two site local but nearby sites, that, that should also be captured. So it wouldn't change too much? Yeah, I, I think even in like an all-to-all -all coupled system, it wouldn't change too much as long as they are few body. Mm -hmm. um, and if you have geometry, spatially local. What, what do you mean by that? Sorry. So instead of defining the size just by the number of non identity operators here, mm -hmm. you could say, I'm only interested in non identity operators. Oh, in this region. Within a, within a region so yeah, so, so that would correspond to, say, errors that only happened in that region. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, that would be the hypothesis. Uh -huh. yeah. And you know, more generally, if you had error strengths that fluctuated significantly across your system, you'd expect the size to be sort of weighting the places where the error was stronger, the, whatever entered into this equation. Yeah. Yes, so yeah, I, I'm sweeping some things under the rug. Um, I'm assuming that, I should say this actually, the errors are small compared to the local interaction strength. And so in this case, your, your operator spreads, 
And you know, it might have both small size components that contain like simple observables, simple information like that, and large size components which matter for the scrambling. And my hypothesis is that for the ones that correspond to scrambling, any local Lindblad operators, whether they're dephasing, depolarizing, spontaneous emission, will have qualitatively the same effect controlled by the operator well, size. Yes, yes. And if you had an error that was on the strength of the Hamiltonian, you would kind of expect that operators don't grow at all, and your dynamics are sort of, uh, yeah, you, you, you don't have scrambling. Yeah, good question. Um, OK, so, so we can break down um, two effects, qualitative effects of error on scrambling, um, by comparing this red curve after error to the blue curve under unitary dynamics. Uh, so the first effect that jumps out is that error decreases the normalization of this distribution. The area under the red curve is less than the area under the blue curve. And it turns out um, that this normalization is actually precisely the fidelity of this Loschmidt echo experiment. Um, and in particular, this normalization decreases at a rate determined by the operator size because um, yeah, because large size strings de get decreased more than smaller size strings. The second effect of error on our dynamics is to reduce the size growth of our system. This is because if my, if my operator has support on both small size strings and large size strings, error decays the large size strings more quickly than the small size strings. So out of what's left, the operator effectively has smaller size. And so more specifically, we have this rate equation that the growth of size contains some positive piece from whatever unitary dynamics there might be, and some decay controlled by the width of the size distribution. And physically, um, this corresponds to an observable where you perform this sort of perturbed Loschmidt echo experiment, and you divide your result by the re um, result of the unperturbed experiment. Uh, in our picture, this unperturbed result is just the normalization of the size distribution. So you just want to normalize your distribution before you calculate physical quantities from it. And uh, this, this framework of dividing um, in this way was actually originally proposed a few years ago. And this is just sort of a reinterpretation of it in the context of this size distribution, where this denominator is just the normalization of that distribution. OK. And so now that we have these sort of uh, these growth equations, I want to just uh, give two ex example systems where we can use these equations and um, some simple numerics to show that uh, this, um, the solutions to these equations sort of vary very differently depending on what the specific unitary dynamics are here. Yeah, Emo? How do you understand the second term, like the delta x? This one? Yeah, yeah so um, if I say my distribution was very narrow, Every polystring has the same size. And so error decreases every polystring about the same amount. And so my average size doesn't change. But if I have a very broad distribution, then it decreases the high size ones much more than the small size ones. And so what's left is of smaller size. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, so that uh, gets very nicely to our first example. Um, so our first example, I'm going to consider you know, what the solution to this equation is for 1D systems with no conserved quantities. So say just a locally interacting spin chain um, with uh, no conserved quantities. Now there, there's been a lot of works that have studied this. Um, the intuition, of course, is that operators spread according to some light cone, so the size grows ballistically in time. And moreover, there are some simple arguments that Nearly all poly strings within that light cone have support approximately across the entire light cone. And so this tells us that the size distribution is very narrow. Almost every string has support across the entire light cone. And so our size distribution is just some, you know, approximately delta function peak traveling rightward um, with velocity VB, the butterfly velocity. And so, uh, you know, as I just responded to Emu's question, um, when the size distribution is very peaked, uh, when we apply error, it decreases the normalization. It brings that red curve down. But all the strings had approximately the same size. So the average size doesn't change nearly at all. And we can verify this um, in numerics. 
so these numerics are on what are called random unitary circuits. They're basically efficiently simulable toy models for scrambling dynamics. Um, and because they're efficiently simulable, we can go to quite large sizes quite easily. And what we see, indeed, is that the size growth is nearly entirely unaffected by error. So this top black curve is the size growth under unitary dynamics. It grows linearly before saturating. And under error, this slightly decreases the growth, but in a, a small way, in a way that's sort of captured by uh, theoretical models um, and is really sort of a finite size effect. And uh, also, um, this sort of follows trivially in random unitary circuits, but um, the normalization is just the solution to this equation dt log n is proportional to size. And so it's e to the minus epsilon times the integral of size over time. So if size grows linearly, this normalization decays like a quadratic, the exponential of a quadratic. And um, so I just want to mention that this result is consistent with uh, recent experiments measuring scrambling in a 1D system. So this is an experiment by Google. They see that the time reversal error indeed decays. So they do indeed have strong errors in their system, but the operator still spreads approximately ballistically. Um, so this is, you know, sort of qualitatively captured by this framework. What are the dashed lines in the result? Yeah, the dashed lines are um, solutions, actually, to this equation, where for the unitary piece, we just plug in the butterfly velocity. So normally, size would just grow with a rate equal to the butterfly velocity. And here, we're just solving that equation where we uh, sort of make an onsatz that the unitary piece is the butterfly velocity, and this is epsilon times the size width. Uh, we know the size width is approximately the square root of the size in these systems, and then we can just solve this equation. Um, oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, these are Clifford. Uh huh. So, so for random unitary circuits, it, it's um, the idea is you have some uh, circuit that's composed of har random unitaries between each qubit, and it turns out that if you average over the results of all these har random unitaries, you can show that the dynamics is equivalent to if you just simulated a bunch of Clifford unitaries and averaged over the Clifford unitaries. But the size distribution is very different, right? I mean, um, this is just like a delta function. Yeah. So the if you average the size, like the size distribution of any Clifford realization is a delta function. But if you average this over a bunch of different Clifford realizations, you'll get a different size in each realization. And that will give you the full distribution. Oh, and you're saying that effective noise is also the same? Yeah, it's, the effective noise is actually exactly solvable for a s single realization, because it's just e to the minus oh. integral size. And then you average, yeah, if you average it over all, you do get the, the Haar random result. Solid lines are simulations, uh -huh. and dashed lines are sort of just this phenomenological model. Okay. And, and the solid line stopped earlier just for numerical reasons? Yeah, the, the reason is actually because this time reversal fidelity becomes very small. And when it does, the number of samples you need to do in these realizations is sort of the inverse of this. So um, this, this would be a difficulty shared by any experiment. If, if you're trying to detect a signal that's like 10 to the minus 7, you have to do a lot of runs of your experiment. And so uh, that's why these curves stop, is because sampling error gets to be too large. But, but the average size does add themselves to the same level pretty much no matter what the error is in the system. Yes, yes. Uh -huh. And this is set by the system size. This is the, the just saturating to the total size of the system. Yeah. So, so the point is, um, yeah, in these 1D systems, the almost all the strings are about the same size, and so it kind of affects all the strings equally, and that means, for the purposes of the average size, it near, almost doesn't affect things. So, the next example, I'll show a case where it strongly changes the behavior because it damps these large strings more. Um, the error rate is. So you can imagine, like, if mm -hmm. you take the size to infinity, it's not going to be the average size, most of the Yes. So there's um, the precise statement you can make 
is that uh, the ratio of the size width to the size goes to zero as time goes to infinity in these systems. The size width grows like square root t and the size grows linearly. And what that gets you is that if you take the error rate, if you have an infinite system and you take the error rate to zero, asymptotically, um, the time at which the size changes significantly, like by 10%, say, is parametrically longer than the time at which this normalization becomes small. And so like if you have some cutoff, I can't measure things below a normalization 10 to the minus 5, then there's always some error rate at which you see basically no effect. Um, that's the precise statement. Yeah. So the probability of producing pro of a PFS probably isn't the same in two cases. The is there an easy way to see why the average size should depend only on like the second or third moment of the case? Average size? Yeah, yeah. The the idea roughly is um you know, I showed this previous slide, um we can measure things with OTOX, and that requires two copies of the operator, so four copies of the unitary. Um you can measure all the moments of the size distribution in the same way. They're, they're sort of non-local OTOX, but it's still like the operator, some collection of other not time-evolved operator, your operator, some not time-evolved operators. So all the moments, the full size distribution is determined by essentially OTOX, and these all contain just uh, four copies of the unitary. Yeah, it's, yeah, um, yeah, it, it's basically like your OTOC has four operators in it, and the not time evolved ones, the higher moments just involve more non local operators there, but they don't actually change the time ordering of the yeah, correlator. The exactly, exactly, yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. good question. Okay, uh, that's okay. Um, Okay, so, so I want to focus just on uh, one last example. Um, and this is an example that's uh, very relevant um, to a lot of us. Um, so this is an all-to-all -all coupled model. So I'll call it 0D. Um, and in these models, um, size typically grows exponentially in time, according to some Lyapunov exponent, lambda. And um, what's moreover, what you can show is that fluctuations in the size also grow exponentially in time um, with the same exponent. And so these are necessarily always very broad size distributions. And so just naively, you know, they're a superposition of strings of very different size. We think that these would be very susceptible to experimental error. And indeed, this is the case. Um, so what we can actually predict um, is that the effective size in these models saturates to a value independent of the system size that's set by the ratio of the Lyapunov exponent to the error strength. So the intuition is basically whenever a si size grows beyond this value, it gets lost to the bath. And so our effective size of the things that remain in our system is always the same set by this value lambda over epsilon. And so we can verify this result in all to all coupled random unitary circuits. Um, so in particular, if we look at the size growth under unitary dynamics, it saturates to the system size, in this case, around 1,000. Uh, once we include error, it saturates to values that are significantly less than the system size and given by this ratio of the Lyapunov exponent over epsilon. And so in particular, you know, say if we have 1% error, the size saturates to 1 over 1%, so 100. We have 10% error, the size saturates to 10. Um, and this saturation uh, actually has a sort of neat effect on the time reversal error, which is that the rate of decay of this time reversal error becomes independent of the actual microscopic error rate in the system. Uh, so that is to say the slope of these curves for different values of the error uh, asymptotes to be the same. And that's because uh, this rate of decay is epsilon times the, the size. And the size is like 1 over epsilon. So these factors of epsilon cancel. And we're left with a rate of de decay that's just proportional to the Lyapunov exponent of the, the system. And uh, this behavior was actually sort of a really exciting result in single particle quantum chaos back in 2001. 
And so it's kind of neat just to see that there's an analogous behavior in all to all coupled many body systems. Um, and finally, I just want to mention that, um, again, just qualitatively similar behavior to this effect has been seen, in this case, in NMR experiments. Um, so, you know, uh, in these experiments, it's essentially on a 3D lattice with a very large on site Hilbert space. So, one might imagine that uh, the size grows exponentially initially. And indeed, that's what's observed in this blue curve with no error. And once they include error artificially in this case, they see that the size saturates to a finite value. And so I don't have time to go over the last couple slides. Um, just wanted to mention, we've explored this in a couple other types of systems. We observed that you know, in depending on sort of the range of interaction and the conservation laws and integrability of the system, you get different behaviors for the size growth. Um, Want to mention this also uh, applies to cases where you don't have error, but you perturb your Hamiltonian in some way. This is often studied in the context of the conventional Lashman echo. And finally, I just wanted to point out that there are some NMR experiments that confirm this linear scaling with size in some regimes. And then they also find other regimes where the error scales like the square root of size. And so I think this sort of supports our framework in this regime and leads to some really interesting questions on what's happening over here. And um, in particular, they see indications of a phase transition between the two. I have absolutely no idea how to explain that, but I think it's quite interesting. Um, and so with that, I'd like to thank my collaborators, Norm, um, and all of you for your time. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Is that an interesting transition you're studying? Uh, I don't know. I don't know. Um, I haven't played with it that much myself. But yeah, in principle, this like your size distribution is very broad at early times, but once it hits the system size, it becomes very tightly peaked, and so you expect yeah, there's some sort of epsilon that's like so it might be one over log n, one over n. I'm not sure. Um, at which, like, below that, everything just escapes to the system size. And besides that, everything gets sort of trapped below. Um, yeah, I, I don't know what it looks like. Yeah? Uh, um, so the, the fluctuations in the size, like the size width, is that what you mean? So, so those are actually, they, they are captured by Clifford numerics. Um, the idea is um, to probe, say, the size width, you basically take the operator, then you take bilocal po poly operators, so poly operators will support on two sites, and then the operator and then the same bilocal operator, and that probes the size width. So it has more operators in it, but it's still just two copies of time evolution. Yeah, yes. Um, so, so yeah, the, the size distribution only depends on, on sort of this, you know, second moment. And yeah, so they don't capture operator entanglement, but at least in our framework, operator entanglement doesn't enter. Um, It's, so the, what I've shown is the distribution over the ensemble of Clifford circuits. And what one can show analytically is that this is equal to the distribution over the ensemble of Haar random circuits. Yeah. Yes, yes, but the squared OTOC is not the size width. The size width is just an OTOC with a different operator. Okay. Sure. Yeah, yeah, okay. you, you guys are completely correct. It's just for, for this framework, the size distribution really only depends on things that are like OTOCs with two copies of the operator. It'd be one last study, my question. Uh, 
question. In the <coughs> coastal quantity case, mm -hmm. I guess you took, um, so the decoherence does not satisfy the yeah, so, so things get more subtle in the conserved quantity case. I think I have a slide on it somewhere. Yeah, what you get, um, this is outlined by other works, not, not ours, is that the size distribution kind of has like a bimodal profile. Yeah. This is like the hydrodynamic information and this is the scrambled microscopic information. So qualitatively, you, you expect error to basically uh, affect this information very strongly and perhaps in some universal way. Um, and I, I don't want to make any statements on the small size information because that's sort of outside, you know, this whole framework. Um, so yeah, um, at first order, I think you don't really care what the error is. Um, there will be small changes in how it affects different um, components of this depending on its relation with the conserved quantity. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Let's take the speaker again.